Right. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Angel Goni Marino. Uh, Angel did his PhD in synthetic biology from Technical University of Madrid. Later, he worked with Martin Amos in Manchester and Victor de Lorenzo in Madrid using interdisciplinary approaches in computational and experimental synthetic biology. Following that, he started his own group uh, at, the, uh, at Newcastle University, Interdisciplinary Computing and Complex Biosystems. And since last year, he has been back in Madrid, where he now heads the Biocomputation Laboratory at the Center for Plant Biotechnology and Genomics. And today, Angel's talk will focus on genetic circuits beyond genes, and textual dependency of design parameters. But that's the floor of yours, Angel. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, thanks for organizing this event uh, regularly uh, every year. And uh, thanks for the introduction as well. So um, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, these uh, dependencies that uh, we've been uh, analyzing recently. I'm going to talk about uh, why this is an important issue and uh, what, what is it that I mean about dependencies and how we are analyzing these dependencies. So first of all, let me, let me um, briefly explain our vision uh, here in the lab. We are which I think is a vision that most of you share within this uh, audience, right? So I don't need to go in details here. So basically, uh, we start from the hypothesis, right? And uh, we can build computers with biological systems, right? So a model of computation is just a theoretical uh, framework that uh, defines inputs and outputs and how uh, algorithmically, these inputs are uh, turned in, into outputs. So this is a theoretical framework, a, a theoretical model of computation. And this theoretical model of computation can be uh, implemented uh, using different, uh, different toolkits, right? If you use electronic uh, uh, material, well, you can build a computer uh, like the ones we have in front of us. Or if you are using uh, biotechnology and, and genetic material and uh, living systems, you will build uh, the, the the model of computation with a different kind of technology, right? So the starting point of uh, our laboratory is that uh, the same theoretical models of computation can be built with different types of technology, right? Um, each technology has uh, its limitations, okay? Um, in most of uh, the places where I, uh, where I saw this slide, I think, I'm sure it's not going to be the case here, but in most of the places, people uh, have this picture in mind of me trying to send emails with bacteria or something like that. And that's, uh, that's not the point, right? So that's not the theoretical uh, model of computation I have in mind, uh, but a, a different thing. No? And I'm going to go through a, a different examples. So, uh, well, Donald uh, Nath, a famous computer scientist, uh, said that algorithms are concepts that have existence apart from any programming language. And that's more the, the, the concept of uh, my laboratory. You know? So uh, computational devices is what I would say, you know, computational devices are uh, have existence apart from the technological uh, implementation that you are using. So uh, a couple of years ago, we, we wrote a paper in which we coined the term cellular supremacy. Okay? We were uh, somehow making this parallelism against uh, uh, the quantum uh, folk. No? Uh, quantum, quantum scientists are claiming that uh, they are going to, to have quantum computers with this quantum supremacy, no? referring to a computer that is going to outcompete uh, conventional, traditional computers in uh, different algorithms. Well, we wanted to, to, to be a little bit provocative here, but claiming that we're building also the, the cellular supremacy, since uh, we are building computational devices, biocomputational devices, that are going to uh, outperform computers, uh, uh, conventional computers in uh, different tasks. It is just a matter then of identifying that tasks and then use the, the information processing technology that uh, we have advanced in living systems. And here with this slide, as, as I just wanted to, to raise an issue, and it's how underused the, the, the biological systems are no? in, uh, for the sake of building computers. Uh, up above, you see that uh, well, there are loads of different models of computation that are uh, from, uh, from the easiest combinatorial logic uh, framework to more advanced uh, uh, finite state machines or Turing machines and so on. But biology managed um, um, through, of course, uh, evolution, uh, uh, shaped 
uh, different ways, different mechanisms to process information in different ways. No? So you have these uh, regulatory uh, networks, transcription networks, which is something we all uh, use, especially for building this uh, combinatorial logic in, uh, in genetics. But, uh, but then there is a metabolism, this evolution as a mechanism for processing information in time, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of different uh, mechanistic uh, um, details that are complex, and, uh, and uh, it is just that we are not sure how to use them for the sake of uh, predefined engineering computations, but the mechanisms are there. Therefore, we are claiming that uh, if we are able to unlock the, the power of all these mechanisms, we will be able to, 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 to go to this uh, uh, cellular supermassive. So the, the starting point of this uh, biocomputing um, stuff, at least from our perspective, is this uh, combinatorial logic in uh, genetic robotary networks. Um, uh, most of you, I guess that all of you know how uh, this works, but uh, you have a gene expressing a protein, and uh, you can uh, enter some repressor that represses that uh, activity. So this is a zero one uh, interaction, okay? It's uh, quite clear. So if you do not have the repressor, uh, you do have uh, the, the expression product and vice versa. No? So you can extend this to a little bit more complex stuff, a little bit more complex or a little bit more complex, right? And then uh, you build this uh, zero one interaction network that uh, pretty much uh, makes you think of uh, Boolean uh, logic gates, Boolean logic circuits, and combinatorial circuits. You know. um, this is not uh, new, at least conceptually, right? In the 60s, uh, in the 70s, people were already talking about uh, Boolean logic for understanding these uh, regulatory circuits, uh, regulatory networks. You see uh, here this uh, quote by uh, Jax Monod that says, uh, let me read it, the logic of biological regulatory systems about not bad Hegelian laws, but like the workings of computers by the propositional algebra of George Bull. So people were very explicit of uh, how, to, how to frame the, the internal workings of these regulatory networks. But it is just now that we have the technological uh, advances uh, at hand in order to build it, right? So during the, the past years, we have uh, seen uh, a lot of different samples on to build genetic uh, uh, logic gates. Uh, well, uh, in, uh, to have here examples of different, uh, this is uh, 10 years ago, I think, yeah, 10 years ago, this uh, um, young one engineered this logic gates to have this uh, cello uh, tool building uh, very complex uh, structures. Um, here we just published a, a paper in which uh, we developed one for Sulomon Asputida. So you have many different chassis as well involved, not just uh, equalized. Um, okay, so having said that, I want to raise a warning here that is about reductions. You know? Okay, so, so we need to be careful. Um, in my opinion, with uh, being extremely reductionist here in, in synthetic biology, right? So um, it is not just DNA what matters, okay? There are loads of different things and loads of different interactions and loads of different emerging properties, right? So, so complexity, you know, uh, after all. So here uh, you have this uh, guy, Jax Wokanson. Uh, uh, that's how my friends uh, is pronounced, okay? And uh, he invented uh, what he called the digesting duck. Okay, it's a perfect example of a reductionist mind. Okay, so he thought that well, uh, you could uh, define this this internal uh, different uh, mechanisms for the duck and then assemble everything. And uh, he claimed that it would be indistinguishable from a real duck. Okay, because uh, if you know how these little cops here work. It is crystal clear that you know how the full biological system works, and that's not how it works. Okay, that's that, and, and we have a little bit of that in uh, synthetic biology as well. We have modules to characterize the modules. We we play to this uh, to having this plug and play system. Uh, yeah, but well, the cell is a sm is a small environment. Bacterial cells are small. We work with bacteria mainly. But um, but uh, they are very complex and uh, yeah. So so this is just to raise a warning about that. We should move away from the reduction a little bit and embrace uh, complexity. And it is uh, in that transition from the redu reductionism to complexity is uh, that I want to talk about these uh, dependencies. 
So in computer science, uh, going back to computer science again, we have what we call this dependency hell. Okay, uh, if you have a, a code for whatever the program and uh, you are running the code in your machine and it works very well, blah, 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 then you put the code in another machine and it doesn't work. Okay? It doesn't work not because of the code. The code is perfect, the code is great, but it doesn't interact with the environment in the way that it should. Okay, a computer is a, each computer is a different environment, especially if you are talking about different operating systems, or etc. No, so just here on the left, you have this uh, Python uh, dependency here, right? You have a Python code, and then in each machine, you will have different paths, uh, different uh, installations of different modules. Uh, different environments, etc., uh, parameters, and so on. Um, at the end, the Python code that runs in one machine is probably not going to run in another unless you do, 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 do have all these dependencies uh, working, right? And at the right, I think that this image I like it a lot, and it, it's a little bit about um, what I said before. No, we have all these modules that are very well characterized and that they fit perfectly one another. But then, if you are not taking into account the, the context where you are uh, uh, going to place the modules in, it might not work at all. It is not a problem of the modules themselves, and I, and I think that's an important point. So, it's in the same like in the computer science dependencies, it's not a problem of the code. The code is fine. The algorithm is fine. Here on the right, and the modules are correct, the, uh, the saves and so on, but the environment is messing around with the with the modules. Okay, and uh, that relationship between the modules, or the code, and, uh, and the environment is uh, what I uh, what uh, are called dependencies in computer science, and I think it's a it's a term that we can we can use in synthetic biology uh, with uh, no real issues. So I'm going to show just four uh, examples of what we have been doing uh, regarding dependencies. Okay, so uh, I, I distributed uh, this, uh, the work in four different sections, genomic dependencies, spatial, metabolic, and host dependencies. <clears throat> and I wanted to say, um, I want to say up front that we opened more questions than we closed. Okay, so uh, but that's a, that's a good thing, okay, I guess. So let's go for the first. So this uh, um, um, genomic uh, 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 contextual parameters. Okay, so in this example, uh, we had just a promoter, which is, so we have a, a promoter, which is this uh, place here, and a gene, just, just that, okay? One promoter, one gene. And we wanted to optimize the way this thing was being expressed because the promoter was very leaky and uh, the whole thing was very noisy and so on. Okay? So we didn't have the, the sharp zero one uh, behavior that we wanted for a specific application. So, well, uh, we have two options, right? We could have made optimized the uh, sequences, the IT devolution or whatever the technique, or we could leave the sequences as they are and build a, a, a structure for, for them to live in. Say, you know? So we engineered this whole structure that we called the digitalizer module okay, in which you can place uh, whatever the promoter gene pairs that you want or whatever the gene uh, of interest or whatever the promoter of interest that you have. And all of a sudden, uh, thanks to all this uh, structure that is around the, 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 the module, um, the, the, this gene is going to be turned from a very leaky, noisy expression into a very sharp on-off signal. Okay? Here in the, in the experiment, you can see how leaky this promoter was. You can see this, uh, the, there was a huge basal activity. This, this is not even on, and the promoter was inducible. There is a whole lot of basal activity, and the basal activity after using the digitalization module was completely zero. Okay? So for that, I'm not going to get into details unless you want after in the questions, but there is a small RNA that is repressing the, 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 the basal expression and the small RNA itself is repressed after uh, when the, the promoter is induced. And so there is a double negative feedback loop. Um, the whole take home uh, uh, message of this is that uh, we provided an environment, okay, where you can place your code and it will perform a zero one function. Okay. 
that code, which is the promoter and the, and the gene, uh, can be replaced by another one. And uh, it doesn't matter if you didn't optimize the sequences uh, uh, beforehand. All of a sudden, the, the digitalizer is going to digitalize your stuff. Okay. So, so okay, this is, a, a, I am referring to this uh, genomic uh, context here to, to raise the issue that whatever surrounds uh, the, your gen genetic circuit of interest, it matters and uh, it can be designed and it can be engineered. You can engineer that, that, that surrounding environment in order to, uh, to favor uh, whatever the, the, the function that you want. Okay, so that's for the, for the genomic environment, genomic dependencies. Let's say. Um, that was an example. And now let me show an example of a, what uh, we refer to as a spatial dependencies. Um, this is a, a, a work that is close to my heart because I worked on it for the, uh, I, I am still working on, on this issue. Okay, this is an, still a, this is still an open question in my lab. So we um, showed a few years ago, this is uh, 2016, so five uh, years already, that uh, if you had two, uh, two modules, in this case, just uh, two, uh, two promoter gene uh, couples, uh, in which one induced the other, okay, so they were connected through this uh, regulatory uh, interaction. If you place them very close together in, in, in a chromosome, if you inserted them close together, or if you inserted them very far apart, the uh, final response, the final output that you are having in the GFP readout you know, was different. Okay? The signal is different, it's totally different, completely different. Okay? Although the two signals are on, let's say, it is clear that this peak over here is completely different from this one over here. Okay, so the, the, the signal is uh, something different, the average is different, the, the noise is different, it can be used for different applications. Okay, so so this is this was uh, uh, something that made us uh, think a lot. Okay, so okay, we have the, the same modules, the same DNA sequences, but depending whereabouts in the in the, in the cell you place them, the, the, the final performance is going to be different. So why is that happening? Uh, well, because although this, the cell, the bacterial cell is very small, it's a very small place compartment, okay? uh, there is some space, uh, some intracellular space, no? and uh, the cell is not homogeneous. Uh, there, are, there are no compartments in prokaryotes, like in eukaryotes, but there are no physical compartments, but uh, there are some uh, um, organization, let's say. No? There are, uh, you see proteins that are in the middle, proteins that are in the balls, the chromosome is divided into different sections and so on. And uh, a regulator, a transcription, a, a transcription factor has to travel, okay, what I said here before. It had the, the, the regulator has to travel from point A to point B. And that travel, that diffusion across the cell is something that uh, impacts on the way that the, the, uh, the, 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 the circuit is going to perform. So here you see a, a simulation on the, on the bottom right, a simulation which, uh, of course, if diffusion matters, if space matters, then the numbers matters as well. So if you have a lot of different regulators, we have here on the left, the cell is more or less packed with them, okay? And, uh, and that distance effect uh, isn't really shown. But if you have very few regulators, okay, there are, of, uh, there are going to be places where there are no regulators, um, places where there are many regulators or two or three regulators or whatever. So the cell, the distribution of the regulators is going to be heterogeneous. And uh, we built uh, a mathematical model in which uh, we um, included all these uh, diffusion effects and that. It wasn't, the, I thought it was going to be um, much easier, but it wasn't, okay? So, um, mathematical models are, of course, complex structures as well. And going from the, the, the typical differential equations that we are all using from a spatial uh, mathematical framework was quite complex. But we managed finally to include this uh, movement, this diffusion across the, the, the cell, including some relationships with the, the, the chromosome, chromosome sliding, uh, free diffusion, the cytoplasm, and so on. And we were able to match uh, the experiments uh, to, to the simulation. So here we, we, the, we proved the take home message here is that a space can be used as a design parameter, right? If you have a, a, 
connection, let's say, or a module or a logic gate or something that doesn't really perform as you thought it was going to do, you don't need to change the, the, the modules or change the part. That's crazy, right? You can you can uh, play with this mathematical model that we did and see if there is any geometrical uh, um, uh, any geometry uh, disposition of the of the of the system that is going to make that circuit work. Okay, and we showed this in the in the case of, um, of the compatibility between the different logic gates. Of course, if the logic gates, the genetic logic gates, have to be placed one after another. They, they need to be compatible. Okay? Compatible means that the, the output of one needs to be compatible with the dynamic range in the input of the following one. And that dynamic range can be adjusted if uh, you are moving things uh, far or close apart. Okay? So, so, so two genetic gates that uh, look incompatible at the beginning could well be compatible if uh, you are playing with this uh, distance uh, contextual dependency. Okay, so um, now metabolic dependencies. Um, metabolic dependencies um, here would refer to the fact that okay, most um, uh, most circuits, uh, most biocomputing circuits, logic gates, and so on, are done at the transcription level, of course, no gene regulatory networks and so on. But uh, there are many information processing mechanisms at the metabolic level. In fact, the, the, the principles are very different, they are faster, resistance to noise, and so on. So there are a lot of primitives that we could use, for sure, for the sake of uh, computing, or for the sake of processing information. So the first step, I would say, is to merge transcriptional and metabolic networks, right, in some uh, hybrid uh, uh, model of computation. So we did a little bit of this, uh, just a bit, because uh, this is a, a still a, a pretty much an open question uh, in our lab. But um, here up above, uh, you have this uh, this circuit that uh, is half and half, uh, half metabolic and half uh, regulatory uh, circuit. So in uh, in regulation, in transcription regulation, uh, this half logic gates with uh, a couple of inputs. Uh, and then in the in the metabolic uh, network, uh, you can make some gates depending on the on the, on the uh, carbon shorts, for instance. No? So all of a sudden you have a, a, a circuit that depends on a manual inputs that you put from inside on and the, the carbon source as well. And then these two pathways are very different in terms of uh, speed, of uh, yeah, the, the reaction, the stability, the robustness, and, uh, and that. So I think it's a, this is a pathway, uh, this is a path, this is a route that uh, we really need to, to go through uh, because we are going to find different uh, dynamics, different mechanisms that are going to be used. Um, in, this, uh, in this case, we tested uh, a little system with this specific uh, uh, link. Okay. And uh, well, we, we made the output of the circuit uh, perform in different uh, ways depending on the carbon source that you had in the, in the environment. So, well, that's an, an interesting thing. No? So, we were able to link transcriptional networks to some kind of combinatorial dependent uh, carbon source uptake. Okay. And uh, well, that's uh, really pointing towards some types of uh, applications. Okay. And uh, okay, the last um, thing I'm going to talk about, uh, a little bit uh, the, the longest, and um, is the most recent one in our laboratory, is the host uh, dependencies. Um, you can say, well, everything is host dependencies, right? Because everything is within the host, you know, it's partial metabolic, et cetera, but uh, I, I had to put some limits, okay? So let's see what uh, I mean by these host dependencies. So, okay, so, um, we have we had a, a library of twenty genetic inverters. Uh, this is the library that were was used in the in the cello uh, development, right? Um, this here, uh, in the panel A, this is the, the genetic inverter. Uh, this is one genetic inverter. So we had a library of twenty of them. Of course, uh, in order to test how this performs, you have to put this in the you have to clone this into a plasmid. Whatever the plasmid of your choice, 
and that plasmids need to be transformed into a host, and then you measure the performance. No? It is not the case that you measure the performance of, of, uh, of the gate by itself or alone. No? You have to measure the performance of the combination of these three, at least. Okay? At least, because uh, then you can say, well, the host could be using whatever the carbon source or whatever the environmental situation, etc. No? So you, I guess that you can extend the complexity of this uh, host dependency to, to, to who knows where. No? But here in, the, in, this, uh, um, in this development, in this uh, publication, we're using three levels. So it's a circuit, the plasmid, uh, we are not using insertions, no? we're using plasmid, the plasmid and the host. So we just built combinations. Uh, we had the four different plasmids. Uh, we have three different uh, strains of two different species, the Colliance and the Monasputida. And uh, well, uh, different combinations uh, turn a library of 20 genetic inverters into a library of uh, 135 contextual genetic inverters, if you want. So this means that uh, we have 135 versions of inverter plasmid host. Okay, so the, all those together. Um, so this is by itself a, a, a nice uh, a message, a nice, a nice conclusion. No? You have 20 inverters, yeah, okay, that's fine, but you can have many different functions and uh, functions that you can characterize and functions that you can play with if you consider all these contextual dependencies, the uh, uh, parameters and values and, and, and that. So um, one of the uh, most interesting um, Conclusions out of this work is that uh, uh, is the, the nonlinearities that we found in all this library of different uh, contextual inverters. So, for instance, and that means that uh, if you take two logic gates, so two inverters, here uh, we have two, okay, the red and the green. Okay. So, the, the nonlinearities means that these two are going to change their performance according to what environmental context, uh, context uh, dependencies that we are using in a uh, different way across the dependencies. So for instance, here in the, in the, in, uh, yeah, if you start from the, from, the, uh, from the first one, okay, if you are in this context, the BHI, BS5 alpha is the, is the strain and BAN is the plasmid. So if you are testing these two gates, in this uh, context, with this uh, strain and this plasmid, you are getting this performance. Okay. Then, if you change both the strain to this uh, 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 strain and this um, uh, plasmid, if you change both the strain and the plasmid, in this case, you see that both gates change the performance more or less in the same way. So they go to slightly lower. Uh, performance but very similar to what they had below, uh, above, and so on. But if you change this again into this other context, this uh, pseudomonas strain and this uh, plasmid, you see that both change in very, very different ways. So, of a sudden, in one of the gates, so very, this very strong uh, on performance, no matter what you had in the input. And the other one, just the, the contrary, okay, a very low performance, no matter what uh, you had. And the, and, uh, and uh, uh, this is strange, okay? So the, the most immediate conclusion is that you cannot predict what's gonna, what's gonna happen. So you can characterize what is, what is happening if you are doing the experiments, but before doing the experiments, building a model that would predict what is going to happen to one construct, even though you had the data of another construct, that's, that's not gonna happen. Okay, because uh, the, the, the dependencies, the number of dependencies from the host to the circuit that uh, are playing a role here are just uh, unknown. Okay, so, so, so we have no idea. Also, you see this, uh, this one here in the corner, uh, up right, you know, when the red gate had this performance that I like a lot. So very, very uh, on here without any input and uh, very off. Uh, very close, no? When, uh, when you have input present, so that's a and that's a, a performance I like a lot for inverter, but then the other one didn't really uh, change to show that performance. So that's a, a very interesting open problem, okay? To follow this line and try to see how we could predict 
if we can at all uh, this kind of uh, uh, shifts in the uh, performance. So, okay, just uh, take a look at the, this analysis on the compatibility of the gates. As I said before, the compatibility is uh, uh, well, refers to uh, how compatible, of course, is uh, to plug one gate after the one gate after the other. Okay. So if you have this input gate and you have the output gate, and uh, the compatibility says that the output range here needs to be um, compatible or needs to match the input rate of this uh, input range of this gate key. And uh, look at this example that I found very uh, revealing with these experiments. And uh, here, this uh, graph is showing the, the number of compatible pairs using the same plasmid and the same host. So you are not changing uh, either the plasmid or the host. And you have this number of uh, whatever the number it is, okay? uh, of uh, compatible uh, pairs. The compatible pairs are the dark blue. Okay? The other ones are not compatible. Compatible means that you can use them to, uh, to, complete, uh, to put one after the other. Here in the middle, um, uh, uh, you have the same host. But you can change from uh, from the uh, between the four plasmids that we have in hand in our library. Um, uh, you see that the compatible pairs uh, increase. Okay, the number of compatible pairs increases uh, quite a lot, and uh, it increases much more when uh, there are no constraints. So you can use any plasmid or any strain for the sake of uh, building compatible gates. Okay, so 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 say telling the same uh, conclusion. Um, uh, in this, uh, we can tell the same, the same conclusions in this way, no? this picture that is uh, uh, even more uh, revealing. So if you are using the same plasmids and the same host, so you cannot change uh, uh, them, uh, the maximum circuit depth that our simulator calculated, okay? So we, we characterize experimentally the gates, all this is experimental information, but uh, the concatenation of gates was uh, all computational based on the characterization of them alone. So the maximum circuit depth that our, our software told us we would be able to, to engineer is three. But if we go down below, if we can change from any plasma to any host, the maximum circuit depth in depth is 12. So we can increase the complexity of genetic circuitry uh, uh, playing with these contextual parameters, no matter how simple they are, like here, just three holes and four plasmids, and leaving the DNA sequences as they are. Um, this example here, uh, uh, playing with different hosts, means that we need multicellular computing approaches, right? Because if uh, you have different hosts, uh, you have to connect different hosts, you have to build a synthetic consortia uh, uh, for, the, for the sake of it, you cannot do it all in the same, uh, within the same, uh, the same set. Uh, that's also work for future, not to try to characterize what uh, what is the limit then in the in the in the connections, the depth, let's say, of connections of connectivity that we can assemble in a synthetic consortium. Right? Uh, well, this is a, a food for thought for the future. Um, Okay, so yeah, we, we've been doing uh, a lot of work also with uh, trying to characterize what we call hardware and what we call software. Uh, I know this is uh, just a metaphor, okay? So, uh, well, uh, uh, there are limits for all this kind of language, but, uh, but uh, I think that here we, we, we go close enough to, 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 have, to make sense of the metaphor. Right? So uh, what we call hardware is the, the actual structure of the cell that is not just the, the, the genetic program that you are using, right? So for instance, uh, this is an example that is very uh, understandable, no? is the, the coupling of transcription and translation. Okay? So that impacts a lot on uh, how a genetic circuit or whatever the device is going to, is going to work. And, um, it, it seems that Nikolai uh, thinks are couple, but here we did a couple of experiments with uh, Simona Scutida, and uh, we saw that, that uh, polymerases and ribosomes live in completely different areas. Okay, so this uh, translation and trans uh, translation are not happening in the same place. So this in then the, the and we did a lot of study with uh, with a, 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 
a network, a pathway in the cellular sputia is called the toll uh, pathway uh, for, the, uh, for the degradation of uh, aromatics. And uh, it makes an impact whether you have things in the, in the, in just in the frontier of ribosomes and polymerases, so, which means that you have access to both, or you are in the middle of a ribosome rich area, but no polymerases around, or the other way around, etc. So all that kind of architecture is what we call the, 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 the hardware, because as I said at the beginning, of course, things have to travel from one point to the other. So, and that uh, influences as well the polymerases, okay? Polymerases have to travel as well, ribosomes have to travel as well, and so on. So uh, the whole architecture of, the, of the, the host that you are using is what we call the, the hardware. And uh, what I said before about the, the the, the, the contextual parameters uh, impacts on this hardware versus software uh, um, analogy. Right? Um, just out of interest here, um, before I mentioned, um, I mentioned um, this this logic gate here down below, the, this uh, NOR logic gate. This was done in um, in Solomon Asputida with the parts and the modules that, that we got from the cello uh, development, right? Um, the same parts that worked very well in Nikolai uh, did not perform that well in Sudomonas. Well, it's not that they didn't perform well, it's that they performed in a way we did not understand, okay? So, um, so, well, after all, using the same uh, specifications of, the, of that software that was hard coded for E. coli, we managed to make sense of a couple of uh, gates and uh, modules for some and here, uh, here we present, we, we present here the, the, the results of that analysis and one of the working gates, okay, one, one, uh, so one not logic gate. So here in this example, of course, I would say that the, the not logic gate in itself is the software, okay? And the whole architecture that differs E. coli from Sudomonas Pudida, for instance, is the, is the hardware. So, so that's uh, all I wanted to say. Um, and uh, just uh, go to the conclusions. And uh, the conclusions is that, well, we can, we can modify and fine tune genetic performance by programming contextual dependencies. And that's one of the main conclusions that we are working with at the minute. So we can have uh, the same uh, DNA sequences, the same genetic uh, specifications for our device circuit, but uh, then adjust how it works by fine tuning these uh, 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 dependencies or the contextual, contextual parameters. Like I said, with the digitalizer, okay? So you can, you can, you can pay a more uh, um, engineering, if you say genetic engineering approach and try to, to uh, edit the sequence and optimize the sequence and that, or you can do this synthetic biology approach of uh, engineering a module that is going to digitalize whatever it is. Or the, the distance, uh, also for the plasmids and the host and so on. So we'll, we can leave the genetic circuits as they are and play with the, with the contextual dependencies. And uh, the second one, a little bit more philosophical and maybe more, uh, more uh, also very interesting, is that uh, we could potentially build um, stronger if you are more complex uh, by computers, if we exploited the whole uh, power of information processing that is in, uh, in all these dependencies and all these beyond genes uh, uh, structure and mechanisms. You know? So we can, we can just dream of uh, I don't know, having, uh, uh, as, uh, as we claim in that uh, cellular supremacy paper, that maybe we can go beyond uh, the Turing capacity or something you know, with a different type of technology and different type of problems a different type of uh, basics. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, my current team. And thank you very much for uh, all the well, collaborators, as uh, Pablo, uh, Pablo Nickel and Victor Lorenzo, and uh, uh, former members of my lab, like Ruth, and uh, Hussein, also thanks to, to Johan, and to the funders that are all this bunch of people are working. Thank you very much. And uh, we have time uh, for questions. I'm very, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Daniel. I can already see a question in the chat box from Nicole. Nicole, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? 
Da yeah, ich, of course, I can also post a question here. So jetzt, thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> that's my son, sorry. <laughs> so I probably kann missed this. In <laughs> I probably missed the information. I was wondering which kind of model you use for the spatial dependency, where you had uh, the slide with the comparison between the model and experimental data. Yeah, the model uh, was a, a differential equation based uh, parsing mm -hmm. differential equations, uh, but we had different approaches. We had a, a full um, object oriented uh, uh, agent based uh, uh, model, okay, okay. that's the distribution of uh, things for moving, where mm -hmm. we uh, define a Brownian motion for the different objects and so on. But that model had a limitation in that we didn't uh, include uh, chromosomal dynamics. Then we had a differential equation model in which uh, uh, we incorporated a slide through the, the mm -hmm. chromosome and so on, but we didn't have a, a real three-dimensional diffusion, for instance. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was actually my question, but agent-based. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, and Gail, as I was uh, listening to your talk, actually, I was wondering, you know, the, the last bit that you showed about uh, host dependency um, from you know, all these different, I think, 20 different uh, not gates that you analyzed and on different uh, uh, vector backbones and, and different hosts. Is there a general message that we, or maybe not a, you know, a very deterministic message, but do you think that the choice of parts themselves sort of play the role? And, and is there a way that we can, uh, you know, decide on which parts are more portable than others? Uh, particularly as, as I noticed, like some of the transcription factors uh, you were using were probably native to Pseudomonas uh, itself. And so there is a greater chance of a crosstalk there when you, when you put it in there as opposed to something that was more orthogonal or uh, from a different species. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you uh, have yeah, considered? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, that, that's a, a, a full issue here. No? Mm -hmm. So I would say that there are uh, two sides of that. Uh, question of the question of portability, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, you can try to engineer something that is uh, going, that uh, will work no matter where you put it, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, that's the most portable thing that you will have in hands. Uh, or you can, you can somehow, somehow uh, define the function that you want to get and then customize the parts for each of the, 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 the host dependency environment, right? As you said, there are some parts that are not going to work in, in E. coli as well as they work in Solomonas you know, and uh, vice versa. So if you want a, a fully portable thing between the two chassis, you need to go to that library of parts, sub library of parts, we will say, that work in both. You know? Or you can think a little bit in a more powerful way, in my opinion, and it is, okay, I want, and a NOR function, okay? So I'm going to, to, to customize the NOR function to these two sets and finally you have two different, uh, two different uh, physical structures but the same functions, you know? So it's a matter of uh, this trade-off between moving the function or moving the, the physical implementation of the function. Okay? So it is true that uh, it would be a, a good uh, analysis would be uh, to get a library of components that work in uh, two different uh, contexts or three or whatever. Um, I see that Matthias has a question. Matthias, you want to go ahead? Uh, so, so, so thanks for the wonderful talk. It's very interesting. I, I have a question. Like you said, it's like completely out of reach, like to predict uh, the changes with displaced meats and hosts. But I, I would be interested in a take. What, what's the gut feeling? What do you have? What, what are factors that influence it? For, for example. Were the plus meets actually from the same copy number, or did they have severely different copy numbers? Do you think this is the major ingredient there, or there's much more? Yeah, the copy number makes an impact, of course. No, they were different copy numbers, the, the plus meets, and that was the, the, the yeah, for sure, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the parameters to, to have in mind. But even if the uh, with the same copy number of plasmids, uh, you have these uh, nonlinearities in the performance of these gates. So truly, I truly don't know what's going on. Also, there are uh, yeah different 
different interactions from uh, the, the parts themselves to the to metabolism, I guess, I don't know. So it would be a matter of characterizing, not just uh, GFP or something like that, that we all characterized, but trying to characterize a little bit more uh, parameters of the cell in order to, to, to get to know what is making that impact. I think, thanks. And if, if I can for the second question, the second question, like um, I would be interested on, on your take on, do you think, for example, CRISPR eye gates would be more stable? Or, or, or do you think we, we would observe the same things? My gut feeling is that we will observe the same type of uh, variability. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, Angel, um, if there, are you trying now to sort of integrate the different, you know, so you had the spatial modeling and you had before that you had the, uh, uh, you know, the, the genomic context. Um, is there an attempt or do you think it's advisable to have sort of a, a model that integrates these different effects so that we can then tie down this variability to specific factors in the cell and thereby uh, you know have greater predictability overall i understand that when we start uh, you know we have to analyze it as you know but as we built you know these models uh, yeah. Uh, yeah of course um <clears throat> I've, I've also been i've only uh, sorry i've always uh, been involved in a mechanistic modeling no? so that's what we do so we need in order to do this mechanistic modeling with rates and all that stuff, so you do somehow you, you need to know what's uh, what's happening. No? And in order to go there, what you say that is very interesting, and I definitely want to go. We will start uh, anytime soon playing with uh, with uh, uh, black boxes. Now let's say like artificial neural networks and things like that. No? So I can envision some type of modeling in which uh, you have a, a, a reaction with a rate, transcriptional rate, or whatever you want. And the transcription rate is not just a value, but it's an artificial neural network that is adjusted, adjusting different environmental parameters, contextual parameters that I don't know and I don't care, to whatever the, the, the measurements that they are observing. No? So I wonder, I often wonder whether we had that type of model and we did that uh, analysis again, we would find the nonlinearities, or maybe not. So maybe we find some, some values for the neural networks behind each parameter that uh, is actually representative of its uh, uh, contextual scenario. No? So, so yeah, well, I'm definitely very interested in uh, moving from this mechanistic modeling into uh, a little bit more uh, black, black box stuff. Now that is a little bit more powerful also. Okay, but do you think that um, going there, like the amount of data on different sort of conditions that we would have to collect in order to, because one of the, I guess, concerns with black box modeling often is that you can have many different weight, weight distributions that lead to the same, you know, uh, observable behavior. And then how do you differentiate them or how do you, or uh, for certain situations, you may not care, but as you, you know, one element of the circuit becomes dependent on the other, uh, this may be too much uh, free space to fit on sort of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it definitely, that's an issue. No? We tried to do something of this kind uh, uh, a couple of years ago. We thought it was going to be easier, but it, it's not. <laughs> that's why we left it a little bit uh, uh, in the in the drawer. But uh, I think one of the key in order to solve that issue that you are uh, putting on the table is the level of characterizations that you are doing. Mm -hmm. So you need a lot of data. It's not just what I saw uh, that is a. Uh, uh, a few GFP characterizations of uh, different constructs and so on. You need some uh, uh, some uh, parallel analysis of hundreds of different uh, variants and, and get a lot of different data, a lot of different information in order to fit these uh, black boxes no? and get some meaningful information out of there. So I think that the, the, the main constraint for us at the minute is to, 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 to do experiments in a different way with this different mindset that uh, you are going to generate a low sufficient data in order to go there. Thank you. Um, I don't see, ah, I do have a question from Nate. Nate, do you want to ask a question? Or I can read it out. Um, he asked, do you think that modeling the physiology of the host, things like proteome partitioning, might be useful in predicting host circuit interactions? 
it seems that these models are more phenomenological than mechanistic for black box, which would be a little different. Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure, there are lots of different things to model. Um, not just the, the partitioning, uh, which is something interesting. In fact, there are, uh, there are different sections within the chromosome, and not all sections have the same level of uh, uh, performance. If you are closer to the origin, of course, you, are, you have a different performance than you are far. So there are a lot of uh, different things to model, uh, metabolic uh, interactions as well. We never modeled uh, anything of the kind. Um, yeah, there are, there are lots of models. That I, I, I'm not sure what would be the first model to include in the, in the mm -hmm. complexity here. No? Also, in the distance uh, X scenario, uh, we need to have in mind that, uh, for instance, uh, the, if we know the, gen the genomic distance, so how far in, 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 the, in basis no? uh, we put the things. But uh, it might well be that those things, as you say, are so coiled that uh, suddenly they are around the corner. No? So, mm -hmm. Okay, so we need that modeling as well in order to get this three-dimensional structure of the chromosome in order to, to be completely sure that the spatial uh, distance is uh, playing a role here and there and wherever. No? So uh, this is more or less what I said uh, at the beginning. No? When we need, we need to, to break a little bit this reductionist mind that we have. The problem is that uh, if we leave, we are very comfortable there. Okay, so we are very comfortable with our reductionist models and uh, ex experiments and so on. Um, the very first moment we leave uh, that uh, uh, comfort, comfortness, no? uh, we find all these uh, complexity issues that, uh, that uh, we should work, but uh, it's very difficult to choose what type of model, what type of experiment, what type of data you are going to go for first. Right? Um, I I think I will ask one last question. I'm just being a little greedy here, which is actually to do with uh, the very nice, uh, you know, perspective paper that you wrote, uh, where where you talk about uh, biosupremacy um, in in biological computing, and uh, also, you know, directly relevant to this conference, um, uh, the idea of distribution of functions across different cells, and how do you think, uh, you know, this playing out, and what are the kind of, you know, additional layers that one would have to add to these models to to, to start uh, doing this work at, at you know, multicellular community levels. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the uh, multicellular uh, modeling. So that's, in, in fact, with all this uh, uh, contextual uh, paper that I saw the last, we, we proved uh, that uh, it is actually important in order to access some complexity that you are not going to have otherwise. No? So you cannot, uh, you cannot overlap you know, uh, 15 uh, or 12 or whatever it was uh, gates in a row if you don't go to a multicellular scenario. There are simply places that you cannot go if you don't take a multicellular approach. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, we, we really need to go there. And I'm uh, uh, always following the, 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 the things you, you are doing in this, uh, this type of uh, uh, approach. Also in the modeling side of it, we need some um, well, there are quite a few uh, multicellular models out there. So it is just a matter of um, yeah, trying to, to, to use the proper one and match experiments with models and all that stuff. But uh, it is definitely a layer that, uh, that is of interest, of course, is, is in my agenda as well. Thank you very much.